Good morning. I'm David Mindell, chair of the MIT 150 Steering Committee, and it's my pleasure to introduce the MIT 150 Symposium on Computation and the Transformation of Practically Everything. As chair of the committee and as an electrical engineer and a historian of technology, I've become something of a student of MIT's history. So I want to say a little bit about that and put today's symposium in the context of our celebrations. In 1853, William Barton Rogers came north from Virginia to pursue a dream of a new kind of technical education, an ex education that would mix the world of science and the useful arts, theory and practice, what we have come to know as mens et manus, or mind and hand, oriented around this new idea for Rogers of technology. And the T in MIT was one of the most significant aspects of the founding. It really brought that word into common use in the United States. The governor of Massachusetts signed the charter of MIT on April 10th, 1861, creating this unique and innovative institution. And you may recall, uh, that was actually 150 years ago yesterday, which we celebrated with a grand convocation down at the Boston Convention Center. Now we're celebrating MIT's intellectual accomplishments over 150 years in a variety of fields, ideas and inventions that changed our world and helped define it today, and of the courageous professors, students, graduates, and alumni who have gone forth from this place to make their contributions. The MIT 150 events include concerts and other, there's an arts festival, uh, an open house at the end of the month, Yesterday's mid next century convocation was, as I mentioned, the actual day of the signing of the charter. But the intellectual core of the 150th celebrations are the MIT 150th symposia. Thinkers, students, researchers, and professors talking about great ideas, contemplating their fields, and hopefully even maybe making a little progress with some of the more interesting problems. This is the essence of the MIT 150 Symposia, doing what we do best and allowing and inviting the world in. This is the fourth Symposia we open today. The others have focused on economics and finance in January, conquering cancer through the convergence of science and engineering about a month ago in March, women's leadership in science and engineering just a couple of weeks ago, and then late in April, the future of exploration in air, Earth, air, ocean, and space. And then in early May, new approaches to the problem of intelligence. Each of the symposia was chosen for the leading faculty, the exciting new ideas, and the symposiums focus on more than one department and more than one school. Of course, they in no way cover the full range of, of research that goes on on campus, but they all represent cutting edge work that epitomizes what's best about MIT. My great thanks to Professor Victor Zhu and the CSAIL team for their willingness to step up and organize this historic gathering. And it's been a pleasure because pretty much from day one, we could just tell that Victor got it as far as what this all was about and what it might be. And looking at the program, and I'm very eager to hear today, it's clear that all the participants have as well. Thanks again to the participants and for, to all of you for taking the time to be here and sharing your insights. I have a personal interest in the topic at hand today as both an electrical engineer who's designed embedded sonars and embedded control systems for undersea robots, and also as a historian of technology, I wrote a book about the intertwined history of feedback control and computing, which included a fair amount on Vanner Burbush's differential analyzer up to the founding of cybernetics. And I like to say I speak about history to audiences where it's before anyone in the room was alive, although I see that Leo Baranek is here and he may have actually, he was actually around to witness the events I'll talk about. As one anecdote, Bush built the first differential analyzer after several specific machines he called product integraphs, which were specific machines designed to evaluate integrals for the study of the stability of electric power systems. Then the differential analyzer became a, a more general purpose machine, a sort of MATLAB-like simulation kit that could be assembled to model any type of system or differential equations. All it took was about a week of uh, working with a wrench and uh, lots of oil and getting all the, the uh, rods aligned. In the middle 30s, Bush opposed the Rockefeller Foundation for help to fund his next machine, and he was told rather abruptly, we don't support engineering projects, get your funding from industry. Undeterred, Bush reappeared again a few months later with exactly the same proposal for exactly the same machine, but this time he gave it a different spin. 
This is not a machine to simulate an engineering system. This is a machine for research into the fundamental theory of computation. And lo and behold, Rockefeller funded the project. Um, I should add, actually, that the, the, the program officer from Rockefeller was Warren Weaver, who was credited with coining the term molecular biology. So already the biology and the uh, computation were, were linked way back in the 30s. This new machine, which became known as the Rockefeller Differential Analyzer, had a telephone crossbar switch to combine the computational elements electrically. And there was a young master's student who was learning how to program the elements of that switch, who noticed that Boolean algebra might be useful there, and that a switch closure could be modeled with a one, and an open switch could be modeled with a zero. That student, of course, was Claude Shannon, and his thesis, a symbolic analysis of relay switching circuits, may have been the most important master's thesis ever written at MIT. Only a couple of years later, after reading Shannon's work, George Stibitz at Bell Labs coined the term digital. Just four days ago, for my own research, I had the pleasure and the privilege of flying in the jump seat in the cockpit of a Lufthansa aircraft from Munich to Geneva and back again. This was an aircraft that had a glass cockpit. It was fly-by-wire. And the pilots were looking through an advanced heads-up display, which not only imposed flight data on their vision, but also imploded, imposed guidance cues and the predicted flight path vectors directly into their field of view. Such cl technologies clearly change the way that we fly and what it means to be a pilot. And as we'll hear about in the coming days, similar technologies change the way we do our engineering, our science, animation, financial management, and any other number of tasks. The topic could, be not, not could, be more, could not be more fundamental or important. I'll now introduce President Susan Hockfield, who initiated the MIT 150th celebrations and has presided over them with vision and grace. And I highly recommend to you looking on the web and watching the video of her speech from the convocation yesterday, which lays out a wonderful and very far-sighted vision for MIT in the next 50 years. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. David, thank you. What you uh, just saw is uh, one of the reasons why celebrating our 150th has been so meaningful. Uh, David has chaired the MIT 150 committee and um, the whole celebration. It's only 150 days. It feels like 4,050, but um, uh, it has been wonderful, absolutely wonderful, and uh, extraordinary um, expression of what goes on at MIT, an extraordinary quality and extraordinary variety. And David's uh, professional expertise as an historian of technology has been put to use magnificently in setting the context for all that we've done over these first uh, 95 days. And uh, he has become the interpreter in chief of MIT's history, including the window he's just opened on the history of computation at MIT. Uh, all of these different events take place because many, many different people have put their shoulders to the wheel of uh, gathering the people and the ideas together to create events of really astonishing quality. So I want to thank the organizers and panelists and especially our distinguished guest speakers who have traveled from long distances to be with us for this symposium. And um, I'm sure it will be a terrific couple days. David mentioned um, a little bit of our history and I will um, call on our founder, William Barton Rogers, as I've done several times over the course of these 95 days. He is truly an inspiring figure. Now, you all pro probably know that when he founded MIT in 1861, Maxwell's unified theory of electricity and magnetism was 12 years in the future. And I don't think anyone at the time, although there may have been some truly visionary individual, but you know, no one was talking about electrical engineering, never mind computer science, robotics, or AI. But the principles on which Rogers founded MIT are very much vivid and alive in the world of computation at MIT. Most importantly, his goal, Rogers' goal in founding MIT was to make science more useful and the useful arts, and that was the term that was used instead of technology. We would now think of the useful arts as being engineering and technology. He wanted to make the useful arts more scientific. As he looked at the uh, 
industrialization of America, and I would say not the rapid industrialization, it was happening, but a little bit slowly, and his goal was to accelerate that industrialization, he realized that the nation lacked education that would equip people to participate with their minds and their hands in this rapidly changing world. He was a passionate practitioner of fundamental research. He was a geologist and equally passionate about real world applications because he understood that both sides of that continuum fed the other. And of course, from MIT's perspective in 2011, he was absolutely correct because the history of MIT absolutely overflows with examples of people taking very practical, hard problems and um, from those spawning fundamental advances with in turn cascading practical events, uh, results coming from that. And I will choose a different example from those that David chose and I'm, I'm gonna refer to Jay Forrester who describes it uh, in the initial assignment for Project Whirl Whirlwind was simply, simply, and I'll quote from Jay, the creation of a real-time electronic command and control system capable of ensuring the detection, tracking, and interception of any number of incoming bombers anywhere at any time over the skies of the United States, modest. Uh, but to get there, the team would ultimately bring forth the re first real-time digital computer, the first digital network, and the first practical application of information theory. And that was just for starters. Fernando Corbato's advances in time sharing, the revolutionary early developments of artificial intelligence, the cryptographic leaps of Ron Rivest and his colleagues, just a few MIT examples of how fundamental research questions coupled with the impetus of a specific technical challenge have opened entirely new conceptual areas with enormous benefits to the world. So uh, today's symposium, today's and tomorrow's computation and the transformation of practically everything, suitably modest title, um, but I would say while not modest, it is entirely accurate. Um, you all understand that I am not a computer scientist nor am I an electrical engineer. My father was an electrical engineer, but somehow these things are not Lamarckian. So um, I'm a biologist and I will speak as a biologist I have to say I have seen firsthand that computation is contagious. Uh, many have accused biology, and I think appropriately, of being relatively slow to pick up and appreciate the wonders that computation has worked on practically everything. But now with the power of computation massively infiltrating biology, biology is accelerating in ways that simply could not have been anticipated when I was a student of the field many years ago. And that acceleration is only possible because of the contributions of many of the speakers who we will hear from over these next two days. So not to um, distract you with other, other uh, descriptions of the distant past and to get on with the future, I wanna start this symposium off by introducing with great pleasure someone who embodies the MIT ideal of exceptional technical achievement, united with great service two of our fundamental values. The Delta Electronics Professor of Electrical Engineering Computer Science, CSAIL Director Victor Zhu. Victor is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and an academician of the Academia Sinica. Victor began his career working on acoustic phonetics and phonology. From 1989 to 2001, he headed the Spoken Language Systems Group at the MIT Laboratory for Computer Science which pioneered the development of systems enabling users to interact with computers using spoken languages of many kinds. When CCL was formed in 2003, Victor became the co-director and has served as director since 2007. In addition to serving as director of CCL, I also uh, want to use this opportunity to express my very deeply felt gratitude for Victor's leadership in MIT's recent effort to design and implement a strategy for accelerating our engagement in, with individuals and programs in China. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Victor Zhu. Thank you. 
President Hockfield and Professor Mandel, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I want to welcome you on behalf of CSEL, which is responsible for putting together uh, this uh, symposium. The preparation for the symposium took a better part of a year, in fact, a little over a year. Uh, I hope you will like what we have put together for the next couple of days. So computers sure have changed in the past several decades. 60 years ago, the first real-time computer, the MIT Whirlwind, came online. It has a footprint of more than 3,000 square feet and consumes 150 kilowatts. It contains 12,500 vacuum tubes and 18 relays. Now, some of the younger people in the audience will probably be asking, what's a relay? Uh, or what's a vacuum tube? Um, it has a tiny amount of memory by today's standards, and it costs a lot of money uh, by the standards of 1950s. At around the time MIT celebrated its centennial, the workhorse of the era was the IBM 7090. The size and performance have both improved, but it still pales in comparison with today's large computers, for example, the IBM Blue Jean. The personal computer, or PC, was introduced in 1983, followed by the laptop uh, within a decade. Today, computers continue to shrink in size and expand in performance, we are seeing performance far surpassing uh, the older generation machines in the form of tablets and smartphones. In fact, computational devices are so pervasive and diverse, we don't often think of them as computers. Computers and computation have replaced many of the devices at home and around the office. Plain old telephone has been replaced by smartphones that can do more than calling. <laughs> Playing old telephones and typewriters are replaced by word processing software running on laptops. Each kitchen appliance, like the coffee pot, is replaced by th its digital counterparts. Old-fashioned cameras are replaced by digital ones with many capabilities, like uh, red eye corrections and deep blurring that makes everybody an expert. Instead of reading uh, newspapers and books, many of us are now using computer to read digital content. The delivery of music has changed from the records to cassettes to CDs and now to digital download. Paper maps are fast, fast becoming obsolete, replaced by GPS navigational gadgets. Computation has allowed us to radically change the way we acquire knowledge. The encyclopedia has been replaced by Wikipedia. A trip to the library in search of help from the librarian is now replaced by a Google search. In fact, computation has radically changed many aspects of our lives. It has changed the way educational material uh, is accessed and delivered. It has introduced new ways to conduct scientific inquiries, such as earth and planetary modeling and biology. Computation has increased the complexity of architecture. It can make driving safer and more efficient. Computation has changed the way we conduct war and grow our crops. It has also altered the landscape of sports and entertainment. Some people even believe machines as intelligent as humans are just around the corner or are already here. So this is just not to say the computer revolution does not have its dark sides. We now have viruses on a regular basis. We spend an increasing amount of time dealing with cyber trash. And there are unintended consequences caused by the leaking of information. Cyber warfare and internet security are becoming increasingly uh, uh, large concerns. And some of our brightest students have written clever, but oftentimes not clever enough algorithms and, and uh, programs that can bring Wall Street to its knees. So the purpose of this symposium is to actually examine the past and try to review what has happened and what is happening right now and 
uh, try to explore the kind of uh, um, influence that computation have on various disciplines, well, practically everything, and try to look ahead and try to see what's across the horizon. And we have three different type of uh, activities. We have some longer talks uh, given by people outside of CCEL, some of them outside of MIT. And then we have shorter vignettes given by faculty members within CCEL talking mostly about the current research. And then tomorrow we have a Turing Award session. It's a panel discussion of our most distinguished scholars with connections to MIT. Now, I must apologize on behalf of uh, Dr. Kenneth Great Gabriel, the deputy director of DARPA, who uh, just told me uh, a few minutes ago uh, he would not be here. In fact, he spent better part of Friday shutting down DARPA and canceling all the trips. And since Saturday morning, he has been trying very hard to turn that DARPA on. And, <laughs> and uh, until, uh, you know, 15 minutes ago, he was going to join us by telephone. But unfortunately, he was called to the Pentagon. Apparently, they have to turn some other things on. Uh, so I just want to give you a few reminders. Uh, first of all, lunch is going to be uh, uh, served in the Johnson Athletic Center. And um, we have a banquet, reception and banquet is going to be at the uh, Marriott Hotel. And, uh, the reception is starting at 6. <laughs> yes? Okay. This is just a reminder. Please turn off your cell phone. Thank you very much.